The Supreme Court seems ready to rule against Roe. The high school football player being hailed as a hero for rushing a gunman as another victim now dies in that shooting. And the beginning of the end of bank overdraft fees. Thursday need to know. Let's go. Good morning. This is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for Thursday, December 2nd. I'm Jill Wagner with Carlo Versano. Hey, Carlo. Oh, Jill, 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 Jill. The news is bleak today. So before we start the news, I have a quick reappraisal, if you will get, grant me a moment here. Uh, that reappraisal, it's Taylor Swift's 2020 album, Folklore. Now, I know you're a fan, and I've always liked it, but it wasn't until recently that that album has really become a major part of my life because uh, it's what was playing in the car when Franny finally uh, took her first nap in the car seat and stopped <laughs> freaking out. So we've been um, we've been basically playing it on repeat in the apartment ever since. And I got to say, that is an amazing, amazing album. This is the one that came out uh, last summer, like in the middle of the pandemic. It's a real it's a masterpiece of songwriting. I've always liked Taylor Swift, but I, I got to say she truly is one of uh, one of our great musicians in this country. I'm very happy you're waking up to this, Carlo. First of all, I'm happy yeah. that Franny's now sleeping in the car because that is huge. Yes, that's and huge. Congratulations. Huge. I'm glad that folklore uh, is going to have a sentimental <laughs> value for you. Um, and yes, I would agree with you. Taylor Swift was my number one played artist on Spotify. My other songs, by the way, I or, I don't know if you use Spotify, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I haven't I haven't looked at my Wrapped thing yet. But yeah, I saw Mine, a lot of people were doing thought, that yesterday. Uh, Mine is so pathetic. I, it's it's all <laughs> like Disney songs. Let it go, songs right. from Frozen Two, songs from uh, Moana. Um, it's it's just wild. But a big thank you to everybody who tweeted at us or, or mentioned to us that Need yes. to Know was your number one podcast. We love it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Keep keep those tweets coming, man. I like them. I retweet them. Uh, makes me makes me very happy. Me too. All right, let's get to some news here. It seems like the Supreme Court likely has those five votes that it would need to significantly roll back abortion rights, judging by the oral arguments presented in that landmark case, Dobbs v. Jackson. All six justices that make up the court's conservative majority appeared willing to uphold the Mississippi law that would let the state ban abortion much earlier than the current precedent allows. Justice Sonia Sotomayor, speaking for the liberal wing, warned that the court risks losing legitimacy and may not, quote, survive the stench of overturning the precedent that was set in row. Uh, I just want to mention, Carlo, that overwhelmingly Americans, I think it's like 70 to 30, yeah. believe that Roe v. Wade should stand. And I believe that's one of those uh, poll questions that's very um, solid, like it doesn't really move all that much. Uh, so that is notable. And I think that's what Sotomayor is talking about here. And she's right. They, they're going to have a serious legitimacy problem on their hands if they don't already. But this was a very bad day uh, for anybody who believes, as I do, that nine political appointees shouldn't be able to make a woman uh, remain pregnant against their will. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the other sort of uh, thing that's notable from this. There was a lot of, you know, uh, back and forth as Trump was sort of stacking the court uh, in his term that like, oh, they're not actually going to, you know, this is all for show. They're not actually going to overturn Roe. No. Well, if anybody who thought that the right wasn't playing for keeps when it comes to abortion and gutting Roe v. Wade, I think yesterday should have probably disabused them of that notion. They've got the votes. They're going to use the votes. Uh, and people like Senator Susan Collins of Maine, who call themselves pro-choice and then voted for these three uh, or she at least voted for uh, two of the three Supreme Court picks, knowing full well, I think, that this was the intended outcome. Uh, I think she should resign in shame, to be honest. So Justin, Justice Roberts, who is who's been basically the swing vote in so many crucial cases mm -hmm. recently, um, he asked a question about choices. So he was the one that everyone thought was going to basically vote with the liberals here. Um, doesn't look and like he, it. He, it doesn't sound like it. He basically asked, um, he said, if this is really an issue about choice, why is 15 weeks not enough time? Saying it's not a prohibition, it's just a 15-week line. Um, the answer to that, um, that, that the attorney arguing this gave was that for some women, they just simply cannot get, still get an abortion by 15 weeks and that they're opening the floodgates for states to say, oh, okay, let's do it at six weeks. Let's do it at 10 weeks. Yeah, right. Um, and that viability, and that's what the outcome will be. 
is really yeah. the the answer here. That that's when the line should be. Right, which is what Roe and then uh, Casey establishes. Yeah. By the way, this will not. You won't hear about this again until June. That's when they will release opinions from this year's docket. So um, that's when this will happen. The uh, abortion will, I think, effectively, um, you know, abortion rights will be significantly rolled back come June of next year. All right. Uh, a fourth victim has now died following that shooting at Oxford High School in Michigan. Justin Schilling was a 17-year-old student at the school. Meanwhile, the suspected gunman has been charged as an adult with four counts of first degree murder, as well as terrorism, which is notable. Prosecutors say they believe the shooting was premeditated and that the suspect used a handgun that was purchased by his father last Friday. Um, I think that yesterday we said it was an assault weapon or maybe I said that in one of my comments. So mm. I, I just want to make it clear that it was not. Um, there is a petition now to rename Oxford's football stadium after one of the victims, Tate Meyer. He was a star player who was shot as he tried to disarm the gunman, according to his fellow students. Um, he died on the way to the hospital. A hero, it looks like. Um, I, I hate I hate it. I hate that there's these kinds of heroes because there shouldn't be, right? These kids should never be put in this position to begin with. Um, but, you know, there's a through line through these two stories um, between uh, the Supreme Court, what's happening with abortion and um, this latest school shooting, an invisible string, if you will, as Taylor Swift might say. Um, and that is that we live in a country, Jill, that doesn't care about mothers and doesn't care about children. And I hate to say it, but it's true. How else do you explain a situation Situation where the state, in the form of a group of unelected political hacks, can force a woman to carry a pregnancy to term, then the same state doesn't provide them leave when that baby is born, and then once that baby is a child, doesn't protect their right to life in school while simultaneously protecting the right of some guy to buy a 9 millimeter Sig Sauer on a Black Friday markdown special that's then used to murder them in their classrooms. It's sick. It's twisted. And I'm sorry, but I'm I, I just I hate it. I hate it. I'm, it's I, it makes me sick to my stomach. The whole thing. Uh, I agree. Uh, a few developments here. That TikTok video that we mentioned yesterday. By now, I would imagine most people have probably seen it of the kids in the classroom. You yeah. hear someone knocking on the door saying that that he's law enforcement, and the kids or the students basically are like, "Sorry, we're not opening the door. We we can't take that chance. It's too big of a risk." Right. Um, Smart. And then. You, and then they run for their lives out of the window um, and you hear them breathing. You hear their terror. Well, the sheriff says it's likely that that actually was one of their plainclothes officers. Um, not that it totally matters, because, again, I think it speaks to the terror that they felt, um, this feeling like they they were about to die. Um, yeah. We've heard text messages from kids. Uh, I, I've heard a couple of students who've read their text messages aloud that they were sending to their parents saying, there's a shooter in the school. I love you. Uh, you know, thinking that could have been their last text that they were ever going to send, um, and that they weren't going to see their parents again. It's it's absolutely tragic. And we talk about victims so much, and it's like, no, no, it's not just four families here. Yes, those four families, sure, without their kids anymore who who lost their lives. Yes, they will forever be changed. And and I don't want to downplay that. But so will these kids who are literally course, teenagers. Yeah who are going to be traumatized for, the, for really probably the rest of their lives. I mean, that is real trauma. And I don't think that we should be underestimating what we're doing as a society to these kids who are just worried about school shootings. I mean, I, and, and have to live through them. I, somebody who survived that, they're still a victim here. Um, and, and I, I and completely I, I agree. I feel like we don't talk about that enough. It, just in terms of mental health, um, that's going to live with them, unfortunately. Um, the suspect apparently made a Snapchat video the night before the shooting saying that he was going to shoot up the school the next day. Um, oh. For some reason, it was never reported to police, or at least that's what, what we what the word is now. According to ABC News, some kids had actually decided to stay home from school that day because of it. Oh, wow. Really? Um, the suspect and his parents, also according to ABC News, had met with school officials an hour before the shooting. Okay. So what uh, we still don't know the, the contents of that meeting, um, the suspect not speaking to law enforcement, apparently upon his parents' advice, his parents have hired a lawyer and told him not to speak. As, as I just said, we, we've also learned that dad could be facing some charges here because as we mentioned earlier, the son had used the dad's gun. Um, and by law, the adult, the dad, had to have that securely out of the reach of any minor in, in the house. 
I, I hope they throw the book at these parents. People in the past have gotten mad at me when I blame parents for things that happen or are, uh, you know, things that children do. But I, your one job is a parent. Like your literally number one job is to make sure your kid doesn't turn into a, a school shooter or a mass shooter. I, I mean, I, if you have a if you have a obviously mentally disturbed child and you're just leaving your handgun around. I mean, first of all, why would you even have a handgun in the house? But if you felt the need to, for whatever weird reason, at least maybe put it in the safe. I don't know. Is that crazy? I, I the, the parents, I, I hope they go to jail, seriously. Uh, no, I, I'm with you. And, and it's also, you know, first of all, they had, if, if, if they were at that meeting, I, look, you can go back, as always, with, with any crime, really, or any, especially a school shooting, there were always warning signs. It's never someone yeah. that they're like, whoa, so we didn't, came you know, out of we nowhere. didn't think this right. was going to happen. <laughs> Um, and, and we just have to do a better job and, and thank God it wasn't an assault rifle. Um, thank God, because mm -hmm. or else I think we'd be dealing with a much higher, um, death count here. And, and, and it also, and obviously any life taken is too much, but, right. um, the and it also seems like, no, no, Jill, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just, gonna, I, I was just going to say it also, it also seems like, you know, these drills that these kids have to do, which are terrible in and of themselves may have saved some lives here because it sure seems like these kids knew what to do. They knew to lock themselves in that room and to not open the door for anybody. It seems like the cops actually had a pretty good response. They were there within a couple minutes. So it's terrible to say it, but it sounds like, um, you know, these, the, these lockdown drills that, that we make students do may have actually saved some lives here. Um, switching gears, President Biden planning to announce today that people with private insurance can get reimbursed for those at-home COVID tests and that international travelers will have to give a negative test within a day of departing for the U.S. The mask mandate for travel is also being extended into March. The new measures are part of the White House's strategy for containing the Omicron variant, which has now been confirmed to be in the country. The first infected patient fully vaccinated, a resident of San Francisco, who returned from South Africa on November 22nd, but apparently had a pretty mild case. Yeah. Uh, my invisible string metaphor actually kind of works for COVID, too, because we're still levying, you know, the harshest restrictions on children, of course, making them eat outside in the cold and uh, wear masks all day. You know, some of these kids are going to go through like their school years not knowing what their friends' faces look like, uh, even though they are the age group least impacted by this virus. But back to uh, the testing thing that, that you just mentioned that Biden's going to announce today. Uh, it, it's classic, classic federal government, right? It's like, let's put the burden on us, the people, to get the test reimbursed instead of just subsidizing them or making them free. Uh, in Britain, you can walk into a pharmacy and just take a grab. You can grab an at-home test. Just take it home. They're free. Nothing easy to come by, easy to do. Not here, of course. Uh, and one other thing I just wanted to mention on COVID, uh, just a shout out to Rob who sent us this study from Northwestern that sort of proves what we were saying about how this uh, should have been a three-dose um, vaccine from the beginning. The study showing that the boosters actually increase your protection over what it was after two doses. So it's not just that the booster brings you back to that baseline, um, you know, the baseline that you would have been ha that you would have had like two weeks after your second dose. It actually increases it. So again, all the more reason to think of the vaccines at this point as a three dose regimen. Uh, former President Trump, this is this is crazy news. Former President Trump, think back uh, to about last yeah. year at this time, uh, tested positive for COVID three days before his first debate against President Biden last September. OK, this is according to a bombshell excerpt from a new book by Mark Meadows, Trump's chief of staff at the time. Meadows reveals that Trump threw a po uh, had a positive test um, on September 26th, the same day that he presided over that infamous Rose Garden ceremony for Amy Coney Barrett, that's now widely considered to have been a super spreader event. He then got a negative uh, result with a second test before he started to feel sick, according to Meadows. The positive test was three days before the debate and six days before Trump announced that he had COVID and was hospitalized. So now the thinking here is that Trump was actually the super spreader yeah. <laughs> at that event for Amy Coney Barrett. Um, I, I've read tweets from a, a reporter who got COVID and now he thinks he got COVID Michael from Trump Scher. Yeah. because um, yeah. he said, look, at, at he said, Trump, if, if this is accurate, I had done an interview with Trump or as part of like a press briefing close up where he wasn't wearing a mask. Um, right. and, and then he got COVID. So it's just... I, I'm almost speechless at, yeah. at the recklessness here. Um, God forbid somebody oh, had gotten COVID and, and died. 
Well, I, I mean, I, Jill, it's, it's, it's wild. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's it, the reckless. I mean, I don't mean to laugh, because, but this is so this is so beyond absurd. I mean, this is one of those stories that like you if you put it in a screenplay, you'd be like, that's ridiculous. Come on here. Um, because we're look, the bottom line, first of all, a couple things, right? This confirms what you said, that Trump is almost certainly that super spreader, spreader at the Rose Garden. But more importantly, what this shows is that Trump was sick during the first debate. So that the, the what, what that means is the then president was covid positive and infectious when he met the 77 year old now president in person for a two hour indoor speaking event and everybody just kept it a secret. I mean, is there any takeaway from that other than that tr Trump was literally trying to kill Joe Biden? <laughs> I mean, I, seriously, like I think that that was probably in his head. I, I, I can't. Uh, otherwise, I can't explain it. Also, in that six day window, just in addition to the debate, Trump also presided over an indoor ceremony with Gold Star military families. And he later suggested they uh, were the, the ones who uh, that event was what gave him the virus. That so was, we know that's, that that's equally, yeah, uh, equally again, you can't. Insane. <laughs> yeah, you can't make it up. It's just the thing that never ceases to amaze me about Trump, and I'm so sick of talking about him. But, you know, it's just what a terrible person he is, like at, at a baseline level. And the fact that there's still like 20 or 25 percent of the American public not, not just supports him as like a politician, but actively likes him as a person. I, I, I will never – ever get that. But the other thing in this story that, that struck me is, is, is Mark Meadows. Like you didn't feel the need to tell anybody at the time that the president was shedding a deadly contagious virus and just thought, Hey, this will make a great yarn for my memoir next year. It's like, it's all so gross. In other news, Capital One ditching all overdraft fees, becoming the biggest consumer bank to get rid of the controversial and hated practice of charging customers about 30 bucks when they overdraw their accounts. Capital One not giving a reason for the shift and said it would cost the company about $150 million a year in revenue. Yeah, that's a big deal. Ally was the uh, the last retail bank to drop the fees, but they're not really a real – I mean they're not a retail bank in the sense that they're just an online bank. But the big ones, Chase, Wells, Citi, uh, Bank of America, they still have overdraft fees in some form or another. And I mean overdraft fees, if you've ever had to deal with this, it's been a while since I – I have, but it's they are truly awful. Not to mention that they just disproportionately affect, you know, the people who can least afford to deal with them, right? And I mean, if you've ever been there, it's like it's not even the original overdraft fee that's so insidious. It's the fact that they start to compound, right? So they charge you the thirty bucks to put your that puts your account in in overdraft, and then they charge you another thirty bucks because it's an overdraft, and it's just you keep getting them if you don't pay attention. Um, and you're automatically enrolled in these. So obviously, you, you know, you should uh, you should opt out if you have a bank and you are automatically enrolled in overdraft protection. The Women's Tennis Association is pulling out of China entirely, immediately suspending all tournaments in the country in response to questions over the, the status of Peng Shui, the Grand Slam champ who accused the top Chinese party official of sexual assault before more or less disappearing from the public. The head of the WTA say he still has not spoken directly to her, despite the few choreographed appearances that she has made. Wow. Right. Got, hang, yeah, got to hand it to him. Unbelievable. And good yeah. for them. I mean, it's, yeah. it's so much more than any other league or any other organization totally. has done. Well, and it comes in contrast with the much more indifferent attitude that's coming out of the International Olympic Committee. Uh, longtime IOC member, the amazingly named Dick Pound, um, has said that the, quote, unanimous conclusion of the IOC is that Peng is fine. This, of course, is all happening as Beijing uh, hosts the Winter Olympics in 64 days. So I think you can see where the IOC thinks its bread is buttered here. I still can't believe that that guy does not go by Richard Pound. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that's your takeaway. Um, all right, time for a little more to know before we go. Remember when Congress punted the government shutdown till December? Well, that deadline is here again. Federal funding set to lapse tomorrow night. And there is a showdown brewing between the White House and some conservative Republicans who are pushing for a shutdown in protest of Biden's vax or test mandates. Um, we'll hit this more tomorrow. Yes, uh, we shall. OK, uh, a couple uh, movers and shakers here in the uh, governorships of America. Massachusetts Governor Charlie Barker, he's a, a moderate sort of anti-Trump Republican. He's not seeking re-election next year. That's a little bit surprising. Uh, he was expected to be primaried by a Trump-endorsed Republican. Uh, meanwhile, Stacey Abrams running for governor of Georgia again. That sets up a possible rematch between Abrams and the incumbent Republican Governor Brian Kemp. Abrams, of course, lost to Kemp by just about a point back in 2018.
Another high-profile aide to Vice President Harris stepping down. Simone Sanders, the Veep's spokesperson, leaving the White House at the end of the year. Sanders' departure follows a series of stories about dysfunction and infighting inside the vice president's office. Man, what is going on in that office? Uh, And finally, there's a lockout in baseball, officially. MLB owners have locked out the players, starting the clock on the league's first work stoppage in 26 years. The collective bargaining agreement between the MLB and the players' union lapsed overnight. Both sides still far apart on a new labor contract. So that lockout means the team officials and players cannot communicate with each other at all, including with respect to free agency and trades. They basically just have to figure all of this out before March in order to save the regular season. All right, uh, that is what you need to know for Thursday, December 2nd. Have a good one, guys.